Okay, welcome to class number two, Spherical and Plane Mirrors. Sorry about the video format, but hopefully we can stay caught up with the snow cancellations that we've had to deal with. So today we're going to cover some examples of image formation by spherical mirrors. Look at how lens and mirrors can combine and then cover plane mirrors at the end of this. We'll have a few examples. We have a few clicker questions. Hopefully the video format doesn't change how those operate too much. I will leave you some time to pause the video, think about your answer, maybe discuss it if you're watching this with a group of other peers and classmates. I encourage you to do that. I know it's not always possible. You may be stuck uh, somewhere that you can't drive out of, but if you can get together, it'd be a good way to study together uh, and simulate the class experience as much as we can. We talked on the first day of class, on last Tuesday, uh, about image formation by spherical mirrors. And again, we mentioned that the Virgin's equation works for mirrors just like it did for lenses. So the only change, and it's not really a change, it's just the fact that we have to keep in mind the sign convention is incredibly important. It was important before, uh, but it's a little tricky now, again, because the light reflects off of a mirror. So V equals U plus P. Still the most important equation of the year, and by year we mean the whole school year, not just last semester, so you'll see it a lot again this semester as well. The sign convention, we introduced this last class, is again positive downstream direction is opposite for the incident and the light exiting the mirror. So basically what we're saying is the light reflects off of a mirror, which you presumably already knew, but the downstream direction changes when that reflection happens. So, upstream and downstream have a certain direction for the incoming light, and then they are reversed for the exiting light because the light has reflected. So downstream always means the way the light's flowing, and upstream always means against the way the light is flowing, but the light changes its direction with the mirror. So again, that's the, the central part of our sign convention for mirrors. Now something to keep in mind is that the center of curvature of a mirror is associated with the incident light. So if we're asking about a positive or negative center of curvature, or excuse me, a radius of curvature, then we're referring to the direction the light is going before it hits the mirror. That would be the incident light. The focal point of a mirror is associated with the exiting light, or the flow of light after it hits the mirror. And again, incident light and exiting light have a different flow, have a different direction because of the reflection. So you can kind of conclude from that, and we've, we've shown it uh, in the first class period and did some clicker questions on it, that the focal length and the radius of curvature have opposite signs. That's because, again, because that light is changing direction upon reflection. So we see that in this equation here at part one, uh, that f equals minus r over two. The focal point is half the radius of curvature and it has a negative sign. So the radius of curvature and the focal length are always opposite sign. The power is our same definition as before, that n over f. Uh, so again, power in, in diopters is the index of refraction divided by the focal length of the mirror. Uh, and, and again, the focal length, there's only one focal point, F1 and F2 are coincident for spherical mirrors. It simplifies some things, uh, especially the ray tracing. And the second part of this sign convention is the object and image distances. Again, now U and V, little u and little v, are the object and image distances respectively. U is associated with the incident light. Again, the object, same thing, the object distance, little u, is associated with incident light because that incident light is coming from the object. Little v, the image distance, is associated with the exiting light. Again, makes sense because the image is what's formed by the exiting light. Um, there's a quick summary here for a real object and a positive concave mirror. Uh, and there are three cases Again, you don't necessarily need to memorize these. These should be sort of uh, things that you can kind of derive uh, either from ray tracing or from some of the, the Virgin's equation calculations. Uh, but it's certainly a good uh, thing to check your understanding of why, why are these cases true. And it's a good thing to study. Again, sort of lay out a test case 
drop an image, pick a power, pick a center of curvature, uh, and then place an object and, and determine what uh, properties you're going to see for the image. For example, for an object distance that is between the uh, center of curvature, C, and the focal point F, again, the object that's between C and F, will have an image that's real, inverted, and magnified. Uh, if the object is outside of the center of curvature or farther away from the mirror than the center of curvature is, then it will have a real inverted uh, reduced image. And finally, if the object is inside the focal length, then you will have a virtual upright and magnified image. So again, for a concave mirror, it's a positive mirror, which tends to uh, focus light. I want to delete that. <clears throat> this is for a um, real object and a positive concave mirror. Uh, there's also a summary for a real object and a negative or convex mirror. And that is very simple. Any object distance will result in a virtual, upright, and reduced image. And you can imagine uh, with a few quick ray tracing sketches why that's the case. If you have a real object, and as the light comes in and hits that negative convex mirror, uh, clearly the rays will all be uh, diverging more. Uh, and so the only way that that could form an image would be a virtual image. Uh, and it happens that virtual image will always be upright and reduced. So the table, the, the kind of table of cases is very straightforward for a negative mirror. Uh, and then there's three special cases depending on the object location for a positive concave mirror. Clicker question number three. The system shown below is initially in air. If the entire system is immersed in a material that has an index of refraction n equals two, the object divergence, blank, the focal length, blank, and the power, blank. So we've got five choices. Doubles, stays the same, or doubles. Again, the object divergence does something, the focal length does something, and the power does something. Choose the best of those five. Here's a chance to pause while you think about your answer. Okay, let's take a look at the answer. Again, if you're watching with others, go ahead and take a minute to discuss your answers and see if you can come to agreement uh, or perhaps change each other's minds. All right, so again, we're looking at what happens to the object divergence, what happens to the focal length, and what happens to the power if this entire system is immersed in a material that has an index of refraction n equals 2. Basically comparing what if it's in air versus what if it's in an index of refraction n equals 2 medium. And so we basically need to think about which of these quantities depend on index of refraction. The virgins, the focal length, or the power. So think about the virgins. The definition of the virgins includes the index of refraction. And again, it's n over uh, little u. And so the object divergence is going to double if the index of refraction doubles. The focal length does not depend on the index of refraction and will, in fact, stay the same. The power is defined as index of refraction over the focal length. And so since the focal length didn't change, but the index, of course, does, then the power also doubles. Again, this is just sort of uh, some review of the properties of those definitions. If we want to think about it more conceptually, what happens when you change the index of refraction is you change the way the waves travel. And so the waves travel, their curvature changes, which means vergence and power, those sorts of things change because those deal with the wave fronts. The focal length is purely determined geometrically relative to the center of curvature. And no matter what medium you have this um, mirror in, the focal point is going to be the same. We're not physically bending the mirror, we're just putting it in a different material. So again, the focal length does not change with, with material or with the medium, uh, but vergence and power both do. Clicker question number four. The system shown below is initially in air. If the entire system is immersed in a material that has an index of refraction n equals 2, the image distance blank, and the image vergence blank. So we want to decide how the image distance changes and how the image vergence changes. Pick from the best of the four answers. 
Okay, let's take a look at the answer. Again, if you're watching with others, go ahead and take a minute to discuss your answers and see how you agree or disagree. All right, for this question, we're looking at how the image distance and the image vergence change if we immerse the system in a material that has an index of refraction n equals 2. So we're again, looking at how image distance and vergence depend on index of refraction. So the image distance located uh, by the, the inverted gray arrow, in fact, stay the same because we know that both vergence for the object, the object vergence, the image vergence and the power all depend on index of refraction in the same way. So if the object doesn't move, which it wouldn't if we just simply put this in a different material, then all those quantities change, but the locations do not. So the image distance stays the same. Of course, the image vergence, which is defined as n over little v, would double because n has doubled. So the answer is b, that the image distance stays the same, but the image vergence doubles. So we'll take this first example, where we consider a concave mirror with a radius of curvature of 30 centimeters and a real object 55 centimeters in front of the mirror. All right, we can use our equations, f is equal to minus r over 2, and p is equal to n over f. Now, when we plug in the radius of curvature, we have to use the right sign. So let's remember that when we have a mirror, this is a concave mirror, and a center of curvature and a focal point, the center of curvature is measured relative to the incoming light. So if light's incoming this way, we see the center of curvature is actually upstream from the mirror, so it's going to be negative. So R is actually negative 30 centimeters which when we plug into our equation, f is going to be negative, negative 30 centimeters, right? Those are going to cancel out, give us a 15 centimeter focal length. So that's our, our first question. Then the power of the mirror, of course, is just n over f, or 1 over 15 centimeters. We've got to do that in meters to have our power in diopters which is uh, 6.7 diopters. So we have a focal length of 15 centimeters and a power of 6.7 diopters. We can also find the image vergence and the image distance again. So for this is for B. For uh, the image vergence, V is equal to U plus P. So we can plug those in. Our object distance is 55 centimeters, so we have 1 over 0 0.55. We need to get the sign of that correct. Again, object is relative to the incident light, so an object location is going to be negative 0.55 meters plus 6.7 diopters is going to be equal to uh, 4.88 diopters. And you can do that algebra out. Uh, and then, of course, if we take the inverse of that, 1 over big V is equal to little v, which is 20 centimeters. And so that 20 centimeters is a positive number, which means it's going to be downstream with the light. But again, the v's, the vergences for the image, the distance for the image is relative to the xing light. So that means it's going to be 20 centimeters uh, to the left of the mirror. Okay. So it'll be, it'll be located somewhere um, inside the center of curvature. Right? So it'll be somewhere around there. Because this C is at, uh, 30 centimeters, and we found our image to be located 20 centimeters uh, away from the mirror. For the lateral magnification, we can do that a number of ways. Certainly the, the easiest is going to be uh, little v over little u. Uh, so that would be 20 centimeters divided by 55 centimeters. Uh, and again, that 55, that's a negative distance. So we want to make sure that we keep that negative. Uh, and so we see that that's actually going to be minus 0.36. So it'll be inverted and uh, reduced. 
And of course, that's part of what we answer for D. Uh, so we have, is this a real or virtual image? This is a real image. It is formed uh, here, uh, or we said up here, up uh, to the left of the mirror. Uh, we know that uh, it is inverted because of the negative sign. Real image, uh, inverted, and it is reduced because the magnification is less than one. Uh, so again, a little bit, a little bit more about why do we know that's a real image? Uh, well, we can look at our, our table of situations, and we have a real object that is located uh, farther away than the center of curvature, and that's one of the criteria for having uh, a real image be formed. So we can verify that that'd be a real image. We can also ray trace, so we can draw a ray diagram for that. Let me go ahead and slide this up. We want to do a ray diagram. We can roughly do this to scale. Uh, let me stretch this out a little bit. Let's put C here. We'll put F here, which means our lens uh, mirror. Almost said it again. Let's see. Got to get used to mirrors, not lenses. So this is our mirror surface. Again, the little tails there tell us it's concave. And we have an object. So if this point is um, 30 centimeters, if this distance here is 30 centimeters, and our object is 55 centimeters, then we want to be about here, and we can say this is our object. Okay, well, this is as good as I've got here. I used to think I wanted to be an architect. Alright, so, we start out, we've got a couple key rays here. We've got the ray that comes in parallel. Let's go ahead and draw our optical axis first. That's going to be important. Optical axis, right there. So the parallel ray comes in parallel to the optical axis. Like that, and leaves through the focal point. Like this. All right. Uh, we have the ray that comes in through the focal point. and leaves parallel. There's a better way to find parallel. Okay, And we have the ray that comes in through the center of curvature and leaves through the center of curvature. So we basically just backtrace that a few times. Oh, we did fairly well. Maybe I could have been an architect after all. Alright, so we have an inverted, reduced, and real image located right there, which is about 20 centimeters. If we imagine this is 30, we're pretty close to scale there. For example two, we'll consider a concave mirror with a radius of curvature of 30 centimeters and a real object 10 centimeters in front of the mirror. So if F is equal to minus R over 2, P is equal to N over F. If the radius of curvature doesn't change, then the focal length won't change. So we're still at a 15 centimeter focal length, which means the power is still the same, 6.7 diopters. So we're basically in front of the same mirror as we were before. The only difference is that we have a real object 10 centimeters in front of the mirror rather than uh, 55 centimeters in front of the mirror. So, we can find the image virgins and image distance, V equals U plus P. So again, U, big U, is going to be 1 over our uh, object distance, minus 0.1 meters, plus 6.7 diopters. And again, the 1 over 0.1 is going to be 10, so we've got a divergence of negative 10 diopters plus 6.7 diopters, which of course is equal to minus 3.33 diopters. So that's the image divergence. The image distance, little v, is then equal to 1 over that, which is going to be negative 
30 centimeters. And so again, we measure the image distance uh, relative to the exiting light. So a negative image or negative image distance is going to be uh, behind on the back side of the mirror because light is leaving the mirror. So again, let's just sort of sketch this out. We have this mirror, we have incident light coming in this way, exiting light is reflected, and so image distance is measured relative to the exiting light, so a negative distance would be upstream in that exiting light frame, so it would be over here somewhere. So it would be 30 centimeters behind uh, the mirror. And we'll find that with uh, our ray tracing if we do that carefully, of course. Uh, C comes after B. So we'll do C, we'll do lateral magnification. Again, one way to do that would be little v over little u. So we're getting negative 30 centimeters divided by our original uh, negative 10 centimeters, which would be in fact a positive uh, 3. So we can infer that's going to be an upright magnified uh, image, which in fact we do for part D. This image, if it's going to be behind the mirror, we don't even need to ray trace, right? Anything that's located behind the mirror can't be a real image. So it's going to be a virtual image. It's going to be upright because we've got a magnification that's positive right here. Uh, and it's going to be magnified, magnified. All right, and finally, oh, let's see, I don't think you can see that there. Hopefully you can see that now. Uh, virtual, upright, magnified image. Uh, let's go ahead and make some room to do a ray diagram for this case. Now we're, now we're talking. So, light that is coming in parallel Let's see, we got to draw our object first, so in our optical axis, let's do that. Optical axis right here, uh, optical axis right here. Let's draw our image, so our object rather. So if this is 30 centimeters, uh, we divide that into thirds, our object is going to be here. All right, so if we've got our object there, we see that light coming in parallel, like this, is going to leave through the focal point, like this. So it's going to head out that way, which means we want to backtrace it up this way. Let's see where it heads. All right, so it's leaving this direction. Again, all the light stays over here, but it appears to have come from a point over there. Then, the light ray that's uh, coming in through the focal point, you know, way up this way, right? Through the focal point into the object. That one is going to leave parallel like this, leave out this way, parallel. We want to backtrace that dashed lines again. We see one point of intersection there. And then finally the ray that goes through the center of curvature and the object. Not quite going to hit everything, but let's do center of curvature to the object and back. And then again trace that out here. And I did okay. Not great, but it's so close. The way I've drawn this, these, these rays actually look pretty close to each other. Uh, but <laughs> the dog and the cat are fighting in the background. We're almost done here. So that's going to be our image. Our image will form at the intersection of those dashed lines. We see that it's magnified. Again, conclude here that it's magnified, it's upright, and it's virtual forming there at the dashed line intersection. For our third example, we'll consider a convex mirror with a radius of curvature 20 centimeters and a real object 20 centi excuse me 25 centimeter radius of curvature and a real object 20 centimeters in front of the mirror. Uh, again, starting with our equations, f equals minus r over 2, p is equal to n over f. We can find the quantities that we're interested in. Again, our radius of curvature is 25 centimeters but we measure that relative to the incident light. So we've got, uh, in this case, convex mirror, right, like this. And so our center of curvature is going to be over here, right? Incident light is coming in this way. Exiting light is coming out that way. So we measure relative to incident light. That will be a positive number, right? Positive 
because it's with the incident light. So R is positive, and go ahead and label that if it's helpful, positive 25 centimeters. So F is going to actually be that negative, because it's there, negative R, so negative 25 centimeters divided by 2, which is going to be negative 12.5 centimeter focal length. All right? The power, of course, then power is going to be index of refraction over the focal length. And we want to convert that to meters, so that'll be 1 over negative 0.125 meters, which gives us a power of minus 8 diopters. So we've got the power, we've got the focal length. That's enough for us to plug into the virgins equation, V equals U plus P. Find the image virgins and image distance. If we have an object that's located 20 centimeters in front of the mirror, that's going to be a negative object distance. So 1 over minus 0 0.2 meters for 20 centimeters, plus the power, which is minus 80 diopters, is equal to the virgence. So if we do 1 over 0.2, that's going to be, you know, 1 divided by 0.2 is going to be 5, so minus 5 minus 8, again those are both diopters, is equal uh, to minus 13 total diopters. That's going to be the image virgence. Little v is 1 over big V, or 1 over minus 13 diopters. Calculate that. It's going to be minus 7.7 7 centimeters. 1 over 13 is minus 0.77, so 7.7 .7 centimeters, that's going to be the image location. Again, this negative image distance, image is relative to the Xing light, so negative would be uh, upstream, so positive would be this way, and negative would be this way, so we expect a virtual image. Again, no real images can form behind a mirror, because light never actually gets there, so it's going to, we expect it to be a virtual image. C, we can answer the lateral magnification. Again, simple way to do that would be little v over little u. So we've got our image location minus 7.7 .7 centimeters divided by our object location of minus 20 centimeters. So those are both negative. We expect a positive magnification, 7.7 .7 divided by 20 is 0.39, so we expect it to be reduced. We can Okay, so we'll go ahead and draw a ray tracing image for this one. And we can put our mirror, plenty of space here, put our mirror in the middle of the page here. Again, this is now a convex mirror, so the tails here are going to go back that direction. We'll throw an optical axis onto it before we forget here. And we're going to locate our center of curvature, which was uh, 25 centimeters back here. And then, of course, our focal point is half of that. Label those this 25 centimeters, just for reference. And then we've got an object that is 20 centimeters, so not quite that distance, not quite that same distance. Let's put it here in front of the mirror. All right, we have everything we need to trace these rays. We've got a parallel ray coming in. It's going to leave away from the focal point, like that. It's going to leave that direction. If we backtrace that. We expect it to come from somewhere back here. We don't know where, so go ahead and give it a good long backtrace there. And we've got a ray coming in toward the focal point. So focal point and object, like that. 
And again, it's not going to go all the way in. This is one of the trickier rays because you don't want to trace it all the way to the focal point. Right? That's just going to get confusing. It'll be parallel when it leaves. And that's the part you back trace. So you go back here and then you want to dash this part of it. Again, it's tempting to it's tempting to kind of trace all the way across, but remember that ray doesn't actually go over here when it's at an angle. It only comes it only appears to come from over here. So so that should be a straight uh, dashed line in this case. Parallel rather, parallel to the optical axis. And then finally the center of curvature ray, which goes from the object to the center of curvature. And again, it only goes in, hits the mirror, almost did it again, hits the mirror, and leaves that direction. And the back trace is over here, which is dashed. Okay, so that's a little bit tight in there, but we can see dashed line here that's parallel, dashed line here going towards the center of curvature, and the dash coming across through the focal point, and they all intersect right there. So it actually turned out pretty well. We see an upright, reduced, virtual image located right there. Uh, let's check the distance. It's at about 7.5 centimeters, negative 7.7, .7, which is about right. If this is 25, that would be about where we'd expect 7.7. .7. So looks good. See, see good agreement there. Uh, again, for these for these mirrors, the trickiest part of ray tracing is, is uh, you want to make sure that you actually reflect the ray. So none of these solid lines cross the mirror. They all reach the mirror and then they leave according to the rules of ray tracing. Uh, with that, you should be able to do good solid ray tracing on these types of uh, problems. Okay, clicker question one. The figure below shows several object locations for a converging mirror. Point A is at optical infinity. If you rank from smallest to largest, the real image distances corresponding to each object location. If a real image is not formed for a given object location, then leave it out of the ranking. I will give you time to pause the video and think about your answer. Okay, let's take a look at the answer. But before we do that, go ahead and imagine that we're in class, and if you're watching this with someone else, chat about your answers real quick. See if you come to an agreement, or if you can disagree uh, and maybe change one another's minds. I'll give you a chance to pause and do that. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to discuss the answer, or at least give it a little bit of extra thought. Let's take a look and see if we can reason through this. Again, point A is at optical infinity. So we think about where is the image going to form due to the object at point A. If A is at optical infinity, the image will form at the focal point, which is fairly close to the mirror. If we move the object closer to point B, then the light rays are going to actually be diverging compared to the parallel rays coming from object A. So object B's light rays are diverging, which means that the mirror power is not going to be enough to cause them to focus so close as the focal point, so the image will be a little farther away. If we look at a more extreme case, point C is very close to the focal point, and so the light rays leaving the mirror will be almost parallel, meaning it has a very large image distance. So from those three, we know that A would have a short image distance, B would have an intermediate image distance, and C would have a very large Im image distance. D, inside the focal length, does not meet the criteria for forming a real image. And we can show that by either ray tracing or looking back at the table that showed the characteristics of an image. Again, D does not form a real image, so the answer would be A is less than B, which is less than C. Cut. Clicker question number two. As the object is moved away from the convex mirror shown, the image A moves further away and gets smaller, B moves further away and gets larger, C moves closer and gets smaller, or D moves closer and gets larger. Again, I'll give you a chance to pause the video here and think about your answer. Okay, let's take a look at the answer. Again, if you're watching with other people, go ahead and take a second to chat about your answer. I'll give you time to pause. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to discuss that. Let's take a look and analyze this case. As the object is moved farther away from a convex mirror, as shown, we want to think about what the image is going to do. Again, 
This image is a virtual image, and it's formed by light rays that are diverging away from the point where that virtual image is located. So if we imagine moving this object significantly farther back, the light rays entering will be parallel, which means they will be um, leaving the mirror as if they came from the focal point. So we can imagine an object at optical infinity would create an image, locate a virtual image located at the focal point. And that image, in order for that to happen, would have to become smaller if you imagine ray tracing a few points uh, in between. And we'll draw a quick figure to illustrate that. So the uh, answer is that the image moves farther away from the mirror uh, or closer to the focal point, which is, of course is the same thing stated relative to two different points. Uh, and the image is going to get smaller because as it gets closer to the focal point, uh, the, the point where those rays converge uh, or appear to converge is uh, closer to the optical axis. If we look at thin lens and mirror combinations, we can ask the question, what's the total power of the combination of a thin lens and a mirror that are in contact? And you had a little bit of experience with this in one of the labs where we cut, repeat. Uh, we can ask, what's the total power of the combination of a thin lens and a mirror that are in contact? Uh, and if you trace the light through this optical system, you'll recognize that the total power comes from one trip through the lens, a reflection off the mirror, and a second trip back through the lens. So the equation is to have twice the lens power plus the mirror power, or the total power as written here is equal to the mirror power plus two times the lens power. And that comes simply from tracing the light through this optical system. Of course, if there's a separation between the lens and the mirror, we have to treat this problem like a lens combination or a thick lens, where the virgins may change or likely would change. If there's a cut, retry. If there's a separation between the lens and the mirror, we must treat the problem like a lens combination, and we have to track the virgins through the system in order to find the final image. It's not that much more complicated, but it's certainly not as simple as adding up the powers. All right, plane mirrors are a special case of spherical mirrors. In particular, they have a radius of infinity. So that means they're perfectly flat. It's as if the radius of curvature, or the center of curvature rather, was infinitely far away. That also means they have a power of zero. So plugging zero into the Virgins equation shows that capital V equals capital U. The Virgins incoming is equal to the Virgins exiting. And that also gives us a magnification of little m equals one because the Virgins are again equal. There are some similarities with and some differences from image formation by a plane refracting surface. Uh, of course here the Virgins is the same in the incoming light and the exiting light which is identical to a plane refracting surface. However, unlike a plane refracting surface, the object distance and the image distance are also equal. And that's because there is no change in the index of refraction. Again, in order to have a plane refracting surface, you have to have a change in index of refraction. But with a mirror, the light travels through whatever medium is in front of the mirror as it's incoming, and it travels through that same medium as it's exiting. So the index of refraction doesn't uh, enter the equation in this particular point. So the object and image distance are equal. We can look at a couple of image characteristics. Mirror reversal you're familiar with. If you've ever worn a sweatshirt or a t-shirt with writing on it and looked into the mirror and you realize you can't read your shirt, that's because left to right is reversed in the mirror. It may also explain why we're used to seeing a mirror image of ourselves more uh, less frequently than we're used to seeing an actual picture of ourselves. The field of view is uh, something that's very important for mirror use in practical situations. A full length mirror turns out doesn't need to actually be the full length of what you want to see. Uh, but if you do some ray tracing, like shown in this figure, as long as the rays reflect off of the mirror uh, and reach, the, reach from the object up to your eye, then you will see the image of that object. So again, to, to see a full length 
of yourself, the mirror actually only needs to be half of your own height. The positioning is important. If you want to see your head, of course, the light has to be able to make it from your head to the mirror and then back to your eye. You can redirect light rays with mirrors and certainly see around corners or other applications, things like periscopes uh, and the you know, driveway mirrors that are uh, located around a corner where you otherwise wouldn't be able to see. Finally, multiple plane mirrors can create multiple images. So you, again, do ray tracing. You can follow light away from this red object. The purple rays bounce off of a horizontal mirror uh, and then reflect and create an image up in that upper plane. The green rays bounce off of both a vertical and a horizontal mirror, and there are two reflections. And so the, the exiting green ray leaves an image in the upper right corner. And finally, the black ray that hits the vertical mirror leaves uh, and then creates a virtual image in the uh, lower right area of the figure. Uh, and again, you, you may have seen that in, in cases where there are a pair of mirrors located at 90 degrees or even at a, at a different angle where you can see a, a wide number of reflections uh, or certain kaleidoscope effects from that sort of geometry.